You know, I once went to Denmark and I bought a sandwich that was $21. In some parts of Angola, that's actually considered a good deal. Welcome to the country that has the world's most expensive city. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host, Paul Barbado. You're probably still wondering about that sandwich. But first, let's dissect the flag. The flag of Angola is actually pretty intriguing because it's one of the few countries that has a flag that tries to imitate another flag. The colors black and red. Black representing Africa, red representing, you guessed it, the blood of those who fought for Angola. And in the middle is the Angolan emblem. The emblem is a machete with half a cogwheel positioned in a way that somewhat imitates the old former USSR's flag of the hammer and sickle. The machete representing peasantry and agriculture, the half cogwheel representing industry, and a star on top representing the progress of the country. All colored yellow to represent the wealth of the nation. Now you're probably wondering, why does Angola have a flag that tries to imitate the former Soviet Union's flag? Well, we'll get into that later, but first let's talk about the political geography. In terms of its political geography, Angola is located on the western coast of the southern part of Africa, bordering the Atlantic Ocean on the west, bordered by four other countries. You would think Angola is bordered by three other countries, however, in the north there is that one little small province called Cambinda. This little small sliver of land, barely larger than the size of Delaware, is so important to the Angolan country due to the fact that it produces and contains over 60% of Angola's oil reserves. Now this small little piece of land touches the Republic of Congo, making it the fourth country Country that technically borders Angola. Now, just like Albania that we studied a few weeks ago, Angola is a coastal country, but it doesn't really have many coastal islands. It only has about two. Kwanda Island in the north, which operates as a administrative town that manages the logistics of the oil companies in Angola, and Baia dos Tigres, which actually used to not even be an island. It used to be a peninsula. It was connected to the mainland by a small little thin isthmus. However, back in the 70s, the ocean completely engulfed and destroyed the isthmus and the one water pipeline that fed the one town on the island, which was named Tigres. Tigres used to be a fisher town. However, after that one freshwater pipeline that broke, almost overnight the entire town was evacuated and today, Bayatos Tigres is a ghost town. The capital of Angola is Luanda, which is an African architectural wonder, mostly built off of the oil industry money that Angola thrives off of. A large portion of their everyday amenities have actually been imported, and which is why everything is so expensive. For example, a typical sandwich could cost $26, a pair of jeans $240, and don't be surprised to see a two to three bedroom apartment go for rent for between ten dollars to $15,000 a month. Now, Angola actually has a lot of different kinds of landscapes. In the north and northeast, you can see a lot of tropical jungles and rainforests. In the center area, you can find lots of flat plateaus and savannas. The further east you go, you find a lot of dry hills and mountains. And the further south you go along the coast, you find desert lands and dry, arid landscapes. When you go to the Mojico province and the east side, you see this leaf-shaped pattern from satellite images. And that's actually a really intricately, widely dispersed section of rivers that actually kind of looks like a leaf. If you actually zoom in on these satellite images, you can possibly find native tribal towns and areas that are uncharted and unmarked on the map, but where the people still live in mud huts and thatched roof houses. Now, Angola's land is actually very rich in resources and has huge potential for land cultivation. And actually, at one point during Portuguese colonization, Angola actually used to produce almost every single major crop except for wheat and had a huge coffee, banana, and maize export sector. However, now agriculture is at a very small fraction of what it used to be. In fact, they only produce about 1% of the coffee exports that they used to prior to 1975. The problem is that Angola went through a civil war. And during a civil war, you don't really have a lot of time to invest in your infrastructure in your country. And that either slowed down or completely halted most of the agricultural exports. Also keep in mind, landmines were planted everywhere. However, the country is trying to make a comeback as best as they can. To this day, over 95% of all of the exports actually comes from oil. Now you're probably asking, why did Angola go through a civil war? What's all this stuff going on? Let's discuss that in demographics. As of 2014, Angola has about 22 million people with conservative estimates. And there are three main people groups, the Ovimbundu, the Ambundu, which by the way, Chris Tucker has a possible genealogical tie to, and the Bakongo. Other minority groups exist as well that make up 
the remainder of the population, like the Ovambo, the Chokwe, and the Klingdonga people. About 2% of the population is mestizo, or mixed, between black and white. Also about 1% of the population is European, mostly Portuguese. And surprisingly, about 1% of the population is also Chinese. In the past few decades, China has actually had a huge influx of immigrants come to Angola, mostly for business. We'll discuss that in a little bit. That's actually quite impressive, considering that Angola had absolutely no ties to China prior to 1975, just a few decades ago. Now, the official language of Angola is actually Portuguese due to the fact that Angola was a Portuguese colony for over 400 years until 1975. Now, we've been discussing the people, we've been discussing a little bit of the history. Let's explain a lot more about this in the friend zone. Now, when it comes to friends, Angola is kind of in a weird diplomatic limbo, and it all has to do with, you guessed it, the Civil War. Long story short, Angola was kind of like the Korean War and the Vietnam War, in which it was a proxy war, in large part affected by the Cold War, where the Soviets took over one side and the Western alliances took over the other side. However, it's interesting because in this war, China actually took the side against the Soviets. That made the Angolan Civil War one of the few times that the US and China actually fought alongside of each other for a common cause. Eventually, the MPLA won, or the Soviet backed up side. However, in the 90s, Angola dropped the whole communism thing and adopted more of a US and Western friendly government style. This means that Angola is caught in a weird state in which they still have this tie to the former Soviet Union nations, even though they dropped the whole communism and ideology thing, while they are still progressively making friendships with the West and the US, even though they spent countless years and resources fighting against them. Now, when it comes to China, China still holds on and has huge ties to Angola diplomatically and economically. In fact, to this day, Angola has just surpassed Saudi Arabia as China's number one oil exporter. And in return, China has been investing tons back into Angola. They even built an entire neighborhood called Nova Cidade de Kalimba in the south of Luanda with 750 apartment complexes. Unfortunately, the project didn't go so well. The apartments were too expensive and to this day, less than 10% of the area is occupied. The rest is pretty much a ghost town. Now, in terms of their best friends, Angola would probably consider Brazil and Portugal their best friends, even though Portugal had occupied them for over 400 years, after they had received their independence, they still maintained friendly ties to their former colonizer. Brazil, which also used to be a Portuguese colony, not only shares a linguistic similarity with Angola, but also has a huge business sector that they share with Angola as well. Not only that, but they also relate with each other relationally because a large portion of the black people in Brazil have possible ties to Angola during the Portuguese slave trade. They love each other. Also, Mozambique is kind of seen as like the little brother of Angola, who kind of wants to imitate him. In conclusion, Angola has gone through more shifts and changes in the past 40 years than it ever has in its entire history, and it's still changing today. Angola is definitely one of those countries you'll want to keep your eyes on. Stay tuned, Antigua and Barbuda are coming up next.